Matthew 5.30. Somebody say Matthew 5.30. Say it again. Matthew 5.30. Jesus is talking to a group of people. And he is giving them some very clear instruction. He's talking about the seriousness of sin. He's saying things like this. Look, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Chop it off, right? Cut that thing right off like it's Thanos about to snap. Like, just cut it off. Just whack. Cut the hand off if it's going to cause you to snap. Cut the hand off if it's going to cause you to sin. And then he goes on, he says, if you have an eye and it is causing you to sin, you need to gouge that thing out. He says, listen, it's better for you to go to heaven with one hand than to go to hell with two hands. He says, it's better for you to go to heaven with one eye than it is for you to go to hell with two eyes. But but here's the thing that I want to talk to you about, because I said I think it's before we get unconventional, we have to get uncomfortable. What about our comfort? Like, what if our comfort is causing us to sin? What if, what if we have become so comfortable in the American church and in the American youth group that we have forgot to notice all of the other people who are lost and hurting and dying all, all around us? What if we have gotten into such a comfortable routine that, that, that we are walking by people who are dying and going to hell and we are saying nothing and we are doing nothing? Like, I just have to believe that if Jesus is going to be so serious about a hand that's causing us to sin, cut it off. If an eye is causing us to sin, gouge it out. I have to think that if we are being comfortable and it is causing us to sin in such a way that we are forgetting to be a witness and we are sinning against God and not partaking in the great commission to make disciples, to tell people about the love of Jesus Christ, If our comfort is causing us to sin, don't you think it's time for us to get a little uncomfortable? Don't you think it's time for us to start afflicting our comfort? I don't think there's anything wrong with comfort. I really don't. I just got done telling you I'm getting older. Sometimes I need to be comfortable. Sometimes I just need a couch and a glass of water because I'm old and I'm getting tired. But when our comfort comes at the expense of our calling, that's a problem. There are some of you who cannot be compelled by love for your neighbor because you are constrained by comfort. There are things that are holding you in place. And I'm just thinking that, like, yeah, we have this unconventional generation and we have this unconventional group of students, millennials and Gen Z. You're like nobody we've ever seen before. You are intuitive. You are intelligent. You are motivated. You can get things done. I love your generation. But before you are truly unconventional in the hands of an incredible God, I think it's time for us to get a little uncomfortable. We're not supposed to look like the world. We're supposed to change the world. And you can't change the world if you look just like the world. It's impossible. You cannot do it. In fact, what I would tell you is this, is that we are called to make a difference, but it is impossible to make a difference if you are indifferent. Do you know what indifference is? Indifference means I'm indifferent. I don't care. That person's hurting. That person's life is jacked up. I don't care. I'm not going to rock the boat. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to do anything about it because I just need to stay comfortable. You know that comfort can become an idol in our life? We can worship it. We can become constrained by it. And that's what I want to afflict. I want to challenge our comfort zones tonight because we've got an incredible new missions project that we're partnering up with. The last two years, we have been tackling and addressing the issue of human trafficking, not only on the other side of the world, but right here in the United States as well. We've worked with two incredible organizations. First of all, Project Rescue, who rescues and restores the victims of human trafficking on the other side of the world. Last year, we got to work with an incredible group called Free International. Free International rescues and restores the victims of human trafficking 
right here in the United States. Over the last two years, the students of Illinois have given well over $250,000 to both of those organizations. We have bought two mobile command centers for free internationals that are being put into use right now in, 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 in cities to rescue and restore the victims of human trafficking. There are over five vans that are being used by Project Rescue right now that are picking up young ladies from brothels in, in different places in the world that I really cannot mention right now. And they are bringing them to church, and then they are helping to drive them home. They are helping to take them to jobs. They are helping them find a new life. Students, you did that. Why? Because you thought that uh, human trafficking is absolutely unacceptable. You got uncomfortable about the realities of it. But tonight, I'm proud to announce that we are partnering with another incredible missions organization. This organization is called World Serve International. You guys have got paperwork on your seats about World Serve International. I'm going to go ahead and turn your attention to the very first piece of paper, the more square and squat piece of paper. What I want you guys to see is what it is exactly that we are doing. We are trying to provide clean drinking water to different countries in Africa. Why? So that people can come and get clean drinking water, and then they can be introduced to the living water, who is Jesus Christ. We are going to address a temporary issue so that we can take care of the eternal issue. Amen? So what we're doing is this, is we are trying to raise... $50,000 per water well. I want us to raise $100,000 in the state of Illinois this year for Speed the Light so that we can buy two of these water wells. Our main huge goal for Speed the Light this year is $350,000. That would give us $100,000 to provide two water wells for our incredible missionaries with World Serve International, and then it would give us another $250,000 to buy vehicles and sound equipment for all of our Illinois missionaries that are stationed in different parts around the world that are spreading the gospel. It comes in two parts. $25,000 is for the water drilling because this is not a ragtag operation. We bring heavy equipment out to these uh, extremely desolate areas in Africa. And we drill down deep where there's water. And I mean not a puddle. I'm not talking about a trickle. I'm talking about a ton of water that can sustain villages in the area for years and years and years and years. That's why the cost of drilling alone is 25 grand. Because we need to get to where the water is. And then it's another 25 grand for the water filtration and pumping and distribution system. Again, this is not like a spigot in the middle of grandmother's yard. This is not like a rubber hose attached to a house. This is a massive cistern that we put on top of the well. It pumps the water up. It filters the water. And there are multiple spigots around this thing. These wells can serve up to 700 people a day, 700 families a day with clean, purified drinking water. Well, why is that such a big deal, Pastor Chris? I'm glad you asked. I want you to go ahead and turn your attention to this other card. It's two-sided, but I'm just going to read off of one of the sides. I want you to listen to some of this, and it's time for us to start getting a little uncomfortable about what's happening on the other side of the world. Listen to this. Every day, 2,000 children aged 5 and under die from a water-related disease. 2,000 children. Five years old and under. That is the equivalent of nine busloads of kindergartners that are dying because they don't have clean water to drink out of. The water in our toilet bowls is up to a thousand times cleaner than the water that these people are drinking on a daily basis in our toilet bowls in America. Listen to this. Ready? In the past 10 years, diarrhea from waterborne illness has killed more, than, more children than armed conflict since World War II. 
unclean water has killed more children since ar- in ar- than armed conflict since World War II. Listen, that is mind-boggling to think about. Diarrhea. If we get diarrhea in the States, we laugh about it. We have songs about it. We get immature about it, right? If you're feeling something heavy and you're 57 Chevy, remember that one? Anybody else used to sing that? Anybody. Was that just me? That was a way back song. That was a way back song. We make jokes about it because it's not an issue in America. We go to the store, we get some Pepto, we clean that stuff up, right? Doesn't feel good. We get a little rumble. You know, it's like maybe we had a little too much Taco Bell. But here's the thing. In in other countries, it's because of parasites. It's because of hostile parasites inside of the organs and inside of the digestive tract of children. And they cannot retain water. And so they just lose it. They vomit and they diarrhea all over the place. And that just creates more unsanitary conditions. And that is unacceptable. It is unacceptable that something like diarrhea is taking out so many people. The water and sanitation crisis claims more lives through disease than guns have ever claimed in war. In villages where access to clean water is provided, the infant mortality rate actually drops by 50%. Do you know that by putting two water wells in villages, we are going to help more babies live? Children in poor environments often carry over a thousand parasitic worms in their bodies at any given time. Worms. Globally, 443 million school days are lost each year due to water-related diseases. Globally, 2 billion people use a drinking water source that is contaminated with feces. Listen, at any given time, half the world's hospital beds are occupied by patients that are suffering from a water-related disease. And I can go on and on and on. The stats are staggering. And students, we can do something about it. Nobody, nobody should have to die because of where they live. Where you live should never determine if you live. So here's the challenge. I'm asking you guys to make a pledge for Speed the Light this year. To give to water wells in Africa and to give to our incredible missionaries all over the world. We have our new $100 shirt this year. And our new $100 shirt, for those of you who give over $100 to Speed the Light, last year was Chain Breaker. This year, it is our Life Giver shirt. It's water that's being filled up in a box in a water well. And it says Life Giver at the bottom of it. Every single year that we have a new project, we're going to create a new shirt. Is we ha- do we have anybody who's a size small that has given over $100 to Speed the Light this year so far? Anybody in this room? I know some of you guys have given over $100 to Speed the Light. If you have, I want you to meet me in the booth and back at the merch booth, and I will make sure you get your shirt, all right? If you give $100 tonight, you can also get a shirt. If you're interested in giving $100 to Speed the Light at a different time, we also have t-shirt order forms. But listen, here's the situation. We need to get uncomfortable about this. We can't be indifferent about these situations. We can't be indifferent about people in Africa who are drinking unclean water and dying from this every single day. I want to show you this video. Can you go ahead and roll that up there, Keith? Water is life. Having clean drinking water is something that most of us in the United States take for granted. At the turn of a faucet, you can rinse your dishes, take a shower, and make a refreshing glass of iced tea. But imagine life without clean water, where you have to travel hours on foot in the hot sun just to find a muddy trench filled with stagnant rainwater. Insects have laid their eggs in it, Your livestock drink from it. It is diseased with animal feces and urine, but it's the best you got to bring home to your children and family. Water determines quality of life. Water is essential. Water is life. And water is the vehicle which the gospel is being spread in Africa. Over the next few years, Speed the Light has made the commitment to spread the gospel 
through unconventional means. We are bringing physical water along with the living water of Jesus Christ to completely transform these desperate villages in Africa. Your Speed the Light money will make it possible for World Serve to strategically dig wells just like this one next to churches. These churches then become powerful oasis centers in which water provides sanitation, restores dignity, and changes lives for all eternity. Will you help? Speed the Light is calling you, along with thousands of students across America, to end the water crisis in Africa once and for all, bringing the gospel to the most remote places so that every person may find life in Jesus Christ. I think one of the most incredible things that's happening is in the same places we are putting these wells, we are also going to put Assembly of God churches. We're trained Assembly of God pastors in Africa will minister to the local people and they will give them living water when they come for physical drinking water. We can be a part of that. But in order to make a difference in Africa, we have to stop being indifferent here. I want you to know that it, it's a miracle that you can make an impact in a country where you never place a foot just by giving, by holding loosely to the things of this world. Students, I wanted to challenge you in two ways tonight. The first one I've been talking about, it's impossible to make a difference if you are indifferent. But once you become uncomfortable, once you move out of your indifference, then there has to be a difference in you. The second thing I wanted to talk to you about tonight is this. It's impossible to make a difference if you are unwilling to be different. It's impossible to make a difference if you are indifferent, and it's impossible to make a difference if you are unwilling to be different. I want to call something out in your generation, and you can tie it to speed the light or not, but I think it matches because in Illinois Student Ministries, I don't want you guys to just give to missions. I want you to be on mission. I don't want you to just give to speed the light. I want you to be a light. I want you to change your schools. I want you to change your families, and I want you to change your communities. I want you to be different. So the world can see a difference in you. You can't keep blending in. You have to stand out at some point. You have to get uncomfortable. You have to be different. You have to be willing to shine brightly. Students, there are people in your vicinity, in your schools, in your communities that are dying and going to hell. Uh, you know, one of our incredible missionaries, Dick Brogdon, He's a missionary in the Middle East. He is the leader of a missionary organization called Live Dead. That's intense. And the reason is because they minister in, in, in areas that are so dangerous. It is illegal to even talk about Jesus. If they are caught talking about Jesus, where these Live Dead missionaries are, they will either be thrown in prison or they will be killed on the spot. They live every day dead for Jesus. Dead to the world for Jesus. Uncomfortable. Different. So that they can make a difference. I wanted to read an excerpt out of one of Dick Brogdon's books. It's called This Gospel. And this is an incredible book, and this is an incredible excerpt, and I want you to listen to this. Some time ago, I passed a demon-possessed person. I've often passed a demon-possessed person on the street where I minister. I did not know him, but I knew he was possessed. I could feel it. I could see it in the wildness 
of his eyes. I could smell it in the filth of his body. I could sense it in the evil emanating from his being. I shuddered as I walked by, for I could tangibly feel and sense the power of evil upon him. And I felt the Holy Spirit prompt this question. Listen to this, students. You felt evil emanating from him. What did he feel from you? But what did he sense of me? What effect did my passing shadow have? What light did he see shining from my face? What, did, what, what I felt for evil did he feel for righteousness? What I felt of darkness did he sense of light? I shuddered and I recoiled at the filth on him. Was there anything about my spirit that wooed him to Christ? When you walk into a room, can others sense something has changed in the atmosphere? When you join a conversation, does the tone shift inexorably towards what is pure? Is there something in, indelible, something unmovable, something commanding of the presence of Jesus from within and emanating from you? Does your life drip with the glory of God? Is there a gravitas about you? Is there a weight of the presence of Jesus? Something that is felt and sensed. Something that shines from your eyes and radiates from your being. That when you open your mouth to speak, the listener leans in eagerly for his imagination nation is already captivated. I want to know if you are different students because the world needs something different than what they're being spoon fed. The world needs something different than the comparison game and the insecurity and the anxiety and the selfishness and I'm going to build my kingdom instead of the kingdom of God. Living for the temporary instead of living for the eternal. The world needs something different. Could it be that you're the thing that's supposed to be different? The Jesus inside of you. When you students walk into a room is there a sense that something special is about to happen? Do you carry the anointing with you? When Moses spent time in the presence of God, he came down off of the mountain and his face was shining with the glory of God so that the Israelites had to look away. Peter would walk down streets and his shadow would hail people. Why? Because he was spending time in the presence of God. I'm wondering if we have any Moseses in this place. I'm wondering if we have any Peters in this place. I got a word for you. I'm wondering if we have any Davids in this place. Do you know that when, King, when Absalom tried to kill David, he brought in advisors and he said, listen, David's on the run. We need to kill David. This is our chance. I want you to send an army after David. And some advisors came into the room and they're like, Absalom, <laughs> listen, I know you want to go after David. But here's the problem with that. Your David's a wise man. Your David's a trained man. Your dad's a fighting man. And you're, 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 you see, your dad, if you go after him, he's going to fight you like a mother bear robbed of his cubs. And everybody in the world is going to say there was a great slaughter that day at the hand of your father. I just wonder if there's any Davids in this place. That when the enemy thinks of attacking you, that when the enemy thinks of attacking your schools, the enemy it just takes a minute and it's like, ah, you know what? That person walks with Jesus. And I know that if we try to go after them, if we try to go after their school, if we try to go after their family, if we try to go after their youth ministry, if we try to go after their community, that they're going to be a slaughter in the land because the Holy Spirit is working in them and through them. I'm wondering if we've got any Davids in this place. I'm wondering if we've got any Daniels in this place. Daniel, who was brought into captivity, who was thrust into a different culture, but he never let the culture change him. He changed the culture. Because, students, we weren't meant to be changed by the culture. We were meant to be culture creators. We are created by our God who is in heaven, and he gave us the ability to create as well. I wonder if we have any Daniels in this place who are willing to live so desperately and differently that people all around us are like, you know what? I'm going to do it your way. Your way's working. Our way was terrible. The food we were eating was terrible. I'm going to go on your diet. The person we were worshiping, 
no good. I'm going to worship who you were worshiping. Your system of doing things makes so much more sense. Ours was terrible. You're going to, we're going to do it your way. Are there any Daniels? Are there any culture creators in this place? Do we have any Esthers in this place? If you go before that king, if you go before that system, you might die. It might cost you everything to go before that group. It might cost you everything to go before that system. It might cost you everything to challenge this kingdom. It might cost you everything to stand in front of a people group and say, I'm going to fight for them. No, 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 no. I want to know if we have any Esthers that are in here that will say, I don't care who I have to stand up to. I don't care what I have to walk into. If I perish, I perish. If my reputation perishes, it perishes. If my following perishes, it perishes. If my comfort perishes, it perishes. I'm wondering if we have any John the Baptist in the house tonight. People who aren't afraid to be in the wilderness. People who aren't afraid to be on the outside, to be eccentric. You know where waymakers live? Waymakers live in the wilderness because the wilderness is where nobody else is. John the Baptist was the, was the ultimate waymaker before Jesus came. He paved the way for Jesus. He did things in unconventional ways. He was bold in his faith. He was different. And people were drawn to him. People were being saved under his ministry. I'm wondering if we have any John the Baptist. Kids who aren't, on the, who aren't afraid to be put into the wilderness in their schools. Put into the wilderness in their communities. So that Jesus can enter in. Finally, I'm wondering if we have any Pauls in this place. Paul was crazy. No, I mean that. Like, Paul was a bad dude, man, in a good way. Like, I don't know if you have any children of the 80s in here. We said bad, right? Like, that's bad. That's awesome. That's good, right? That's kind of our slang. Paul was a bad man. Paul was whipped several times. He was beaten with rods several times. He was thrown in prison several times. He had assassination attempts on his life, and he kept spreading the gospel. You throw me in prison? Cool. I'm going to spread the gospel. You throw me out of the town? Cool. I'm going to spread the gospel in the countryside. You're going to chase me out of the countryside? Cool. I'll go to the next town, and I'm going to spread the gospel there. See you on my next missionary journey. Paul was at one point beaten so severely that he was dragged out of the town and left for dead. The brother gets back up when he regains consciousness, goes back into the town, and he starts spreading the gospel. I'm wondering if we have any Pauls in here. You can knock me down. You can beat me up. You can take away my reputation. You can throw me in the prisons of this society. You can try and uh, uh, segregate me. You can try and, 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 and disenfranchise me. But I am going to tell you right here and now that I will continue to preach the gospel because culture is not my judge. History is not my judge. God is my judge. And as long as I am living and breathing on this planet, I'll work for him because to live is Christ and to die is gain. I wonder, in closing, worship team, you can come back up here. Help me out. If we have any Helen Ewins in this place. Helen Ewan. Helen Ewan. I'm going to read you another excerpt from Dick Brogdon's book. Helen Ewan was a simple British girl born in 1910. She died at only 22 years old. James A. Stewart, a well-known evangelist of that time, wrote, The manifestation of God's glory on Helen astonished us all. Hers was only a common life, but it was lit up with the glory of God, making her so uncommon. I wondered how she could stand so much glory in her fragile earthenware container, being full of the Holy Spirit. She was so full of Christ. Helen would wake up at 5 a.m. to just be with Jesus, to just abide with Jesus. In the winter, she did not turn on the heat in her little room, feeling it could cause her to be more alert in the cold. And besides, she was praying for missionaries, and they lived with discomfort. She prayed daily for the lost by name until they were saved. Her yearnings after salvation of the lost were awful to behold. Helen was an incredible, she was an incredible personal soul winner. 
out on cold nights rescuing prostitutes and witnessing to drunks and walking miles to university every single day, Mark, so that she can hand out tracts along the way. But it was not her personal evangelism that marked her. Listen to this. Her body was a walking temple of the Holy Spirit. Thus, wherever she went, the power of God was manifested. When she entered into any service, immediately the atmosphere was changed with His power. I have known her to slip quietly into prayer meetings, which had already begun, and sit on the back seat. Yet every one of us knew that she had arrived because of the mighty sense of God manifested in our midst. Evangelists often sought after her service. It was not that she could sing or speak in public. It wasn't her stage or her decoration. I don't think she ever sang a solo or gave a public testimony in any of their campaigns. All she did was sit quietly in the meeting and pray. Yet these evangelists knew that if they could only have Helen attend their services, there would be sure to be a mighty anointing upon the meeting. I wonder... If we have any young people that are like Helen Ewan, I wonder if some of us are ready to answer the call tonight to be different, to walk in the anointing, to be unconventional, because it is impossible to make a difference if you are indifferent. And it is possible to make a difference if you are unwilling to be different calling you to something more tonight, students. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have my leaders quietly hand out our pledge cards for Speed the Light tonight. Maybe you guys have already taken pledges in your youth ministry. Maybe in this moment, God is stirring you to do more. Maybe you haven't made a pledge yet. No matter what the case is, I want you to fill out this card and I want you to hand it to your youth pastors tonight. And while our people are coming around and handing out these cards, I want to ask you a question with everybody looking at me. Because if we can't be uncomfortable here, I I just don't see how we're going to be uncomfortable out there. If you're in this place and you say, I want to live different. I just want to have that anointing. I don't want to be indifferent but I want to be different for Christ so that I can make a difference. If that's you in this place with every head up, with every eye looking straight at you, maybe, can you just go ahead and slip your hand up wherever you're at? It's a bunch of you. Yeah, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. I'm going to pray for you all real quick. And then when I'm done praying, what I'm going to ask you guys to do is to get into youth ministries. While the worship team is just playing a little something up here. And I want you to pray about what you're going to do for Speed the Light this year. And I also want you to pray about what you're going to do to reach your communities this year as well. All right? Youth pastors, when you're done, can you please just come uh, up to me and just report what the giving total was? I have to get some envelopes out of my suitcase. But I'm going to give you the next five minutes to just pray as groups, as youth ministries together, and just have this discussion. All right? Jesus, we love you. And I thank you so much for each and every single student that raised their hand tonight that said, I want to be different. And I don't want to be indifferent because I want to make a difference. God, I thank you so much for each and every single one of them. I thank you for their courage. I know this has been a night where maybe we're getting a little tired and pizza's on the way. Praise God for pizza. (laughs) But tonight we just want to do some business with you. We want to dream big dreams. We want to give more than we've ever been able to give before to speed the light so that people can experience what it's like to have clean drinking water and so that people can experience what it's like to encounter the living water. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Why don't you guys go ahead and get together in your youth ministries for the next five minutes.